Episode 86, co-founder and CEO of Water.org and Water Equity, social entrepreneur, Gary White. Welcome to The Art of Excellence, a show about people doing extraordinary things in their lives. I'm your host, Glenn Zweig. Thanks for joining me. My guest today is Gary White. Gary is the co-founder and CEO of Water.org and Water Equity. In 1991, he launched Water Partners International, the nonprofit that would later become Water.org. Today, the organizations he leads are creating market-driven solutions to the global water crisis, driving innovations in the way the world funds water and sanitation projects. His new book that he co-authored with Matt Damon is titled The Worth of Water, Our Story of Chasing Solutions to the World's Greatest Challenge. Gary, welcome to the show. Glenn, great to be here. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. So, you know, it's funny, I, I didn't realize this when I booked our interview here. But uh, you and I are chatting on May the 5th. So exactly 33 years ago today, uh, I lost my mother to cancer. I didn't even think of the day coming up when I booked with you. And what's interesting is it's usually a day where, of course, I I think about her. But it's also a day where I tend to, uh, you know, reflect and, you know, sort of go within and, uh, and pause if you will, uh, and, and be somewhat mindful. And so knowing as I woke up this morning that I'd be speaking with you, I did something I've never done before, which is paid really close attention to my uh, water consumption. Didn't change anything, just sort of wanted to be aware of it. So I got up at my usually uh, early hour of 4.30 in the morning, uh, went through some water on my face, I went to the bathroom, got up, filled a water bottle to go do my Peloton workout. I came home, I had some more water, took a shower, brushed my teeth, had breakfast with some more water, came to the office, went to the bathroom again, and then filled up a water bottle. And this is all by about 7.30 in the morning. I don't even know how much water that is other than it's, it's quite a bit. And I think that's probably the first time in my life I've ever actually really paid attention to it because it's something, you know, as you point out, that for most of us in the world or for a lot of us in the world, um, it's sort of invisible. It's something we just take for granted. So for that long and, and windy, you know, wind up, I say all that because I think that invisibility, if you will, is one of the biggest forces you've been having to fight against to raise awareness for this whole water and sanitation issue that you've been fighting for your entire life. Is that fair? It it, it absolutely is fair. It's something that we have done so well at uh, for so many decades, really going on a century now, to provide water that's safe, sustainable, affordable for our households, uh, that it's just become completely transparent or invisible, as you say, to us. But you only have to rewind, you know, a century or so ago and and realize there were still, you know, large numbers of deaths, uh, even in the United States from, you know, things like typhoid and and cholera and, and other diseases and how that just really, you know, wreaked havoc on towns, cities and economies. And that, that is something that we do, you know, have to work very hard to kind of help people understand that that's the way it still is for about 771 million people around the world who, who when they woke up today, their first thought was water too. Well, uh, you know, yours, yours wasn't like a reflection on that, but you, you definitely knew you had to go get a drink of water. You had to brush your teeth. You had to do all of these things. So you knew that water was important today, at least this morning for you. But that's that's the thing. Everybody in the world, those 771 million people, when they woke up today, 
until they found their water for today, nothing else mattered to them. And that is like what the struggle is. So it's, it's, it's not just about how much this contributes to health to have safe water and sanitation, but it's the opportunity cost uh, of your time if you don't have access to water and how much time you spend trying to find it for the day. And I think that's the important thing to recognize together with, you know, no, no community, no city, no economy that we see today ever got started without having access to a reliable water supply. It might not have been safe back at that point, but that's why you're near rivers, you're near lakes. That's why the cities grow up there. And I think we tend to forget what a basic building block that is for, for our ability to, to have thriving economies. Well, Gary, just to get into your backstory a little bit, and I know you didn't grow up impoverished, if you will, the way a lot of these people around the world are uh, that fight for water every day, but you also didn't grow up with a lot of money either. And I think you mentioned that there was uh, a summer or maybe summers where you worked as a janitor Mm -hmm. to, to help pay for private school that you were attending. Was that by choice? Yeah, it, it was by choice. You know, I think uh, I had to pay half the tuition if I wanted to go to the school that I that I wanted to go to. And it was, you know, I remember my, my first salary there was $2 an hour. So, it was, you know, I took my I grossed $80 a week, you know, throughout the summer to be able to, to do that. Uh, and it was it was definitely by choice. And you know, I think that having that kind of start is one of your first jobs does definitely help you appreciate, you know, what you want to be doing with your life. And uh, certainly I knew I didn't want to, to be, you know, being a janitor my whole life, but I also knew that I was called to kind of look beyond, uh, you know, a typical job and kind of take things in a more entrepreneurial direction. Right. But, but can I ask you when your friends were like, talking about they want to be an astronaut or they want to be a fireman or, or an actor. W were you like raising your hand saying, yeah, a sanitation engineer? <laughs> uh, well, I, actually, before we even get into the whole water and sanitation, you know, part of yeah. it, just in terms of, you know, thinking about, you know, you're, you're a very mission driven person, clearly. Mm -hmm. um, your, your mother, it sounds like was a great role model. In terms of serving others, she did a lot of community service work, as I understand it. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's fitting you open with that kind of story about your your mother and, and how you how you lost her. I think that certainly plays uh, into my life. And you know, we have Mother's Day on Sunday, right? So uh, interesting that that you bring that up because I think it was you know I, I definitely felt drawn towards engineering from a fairly young age, but I also saw that desire instilled in me or that kind of value instilled in me to like serve others. And I think that's what my mom definitely showed. She didn't have a chance to kind of see poverty around the world, but she could see it, you know, in her community uh, where she was and would, would work to help alleviate that. I know, you know, during the seventies when we had so many Vietnamese refugees coming uh, to the U S and even in our town in Kansas city, you know, working to help get them resettled. Some of the, the poverty that was uh, you know, in the, the inner core of Kansas city focusing on that. So I think that that definitely had a, a lasting impact on me. And you were raised Catholic. Yeah. 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 So I grew up, you know, classic Catholic grade school, you know, walk to school. And that's why, you know, the, the high school I wanted to go to was a, a Christian Brothers High School, which is a, a teaching order. And that's why, you know, I had, a, frankly, I had a lot of my friends that were going there too, but it just seemed like where I wanted to go. And I think that was definitely something that helped shape me as well, because those the values of social justice that were imparted there. A lot of the, the brothers who were teaching in that school were also spending, uh, you know, years at a time in Central America teaching the poor there. And so they would actually kind of move back and forth between the U.S. and some of those communities and bring that to life for us and help relate, you know, what life is like in people's who live in these poor countries. So just thinking about the religious upbringing, thinking about your mom, uh, some of the values, you know, distilled in you early on. When did the idea of doing something mission driven with your life, whatever 
form that might eventually take. When was that kernel uh, first sort of, you know, popping in your head? How early are we going back? Yeah, I think, you know, is when I was really an undergrad, you know, studying. In fact, my freshman year, I was, you know, you ask what people are talking about when they when they are growing up, what they wanted to be. I, I wanted to to be an aerospace engineer. And so I started my freshman year as an aerospace engineer, but then started looking at the social justice aspect of, and where that intersected with engineering. So like my freshman year in college, and it seemed like civil and environmental engineering intersected kind of more with social justice. When you look at, you know, discovering how many people then lacked water and sanitation, and then recognizing that's kind of a civil environmental engineering kind of thing to do. That's when I first really realized it. And the, you know, my next step in that was to like, how do I learn more about this problem? How do I, you know, I had never even left the country at that point. Uh, in fact, I hadn't even been on an airplane at that point. And I was looking at, you know, how can I learn more? And that's when I started my kind of my first entrepreneurial venture, I guess. I started an organization at my university. It's now now Missouri s and science and technology, back then it was Missouri Rolla, and would match engineering students up with different types of development projects that were happening around the world. So during the, the winter break, uh, those few weeks, the students, including myself, could go travel to other countries and work with programs uh, on engineering projects. And that was really how I then started seeing this problem firsthand. And that's where I, I, I saw in the slums of Guatemala City, actually, during one of those first trips, how bad the, the water and sanitation situation was there. And that just encouraged me to come back and kind of learn all I could about this, this crisis and then, you know, direct my life towards helping solve it. Yeah. Well, you found, I think it was like two decades before water.org, you founded Water Partners. It was back in 1991. What was that mission? Mm. I had gone to work in the mid 80s uh, for an organization in New York, Catholic Relief Services. Mm -hmm. At that time, it was the largest relief and development agency, you know, in the U.S. working globally. And that, that experience led me to understand how things worked on the ground, how things worked and didn't work, frankly. I'd, I'd done a research project when I was there to look at water quality and some of the projects that we were doing around the world and recognize that, you know, sometimes it wasn't so great. You know, there was, there was some problems with water quality. Sometimes the water resources that we were trying to improve were not as high quality as the river water. And then I did more research and this wasn't just a problem with, with our organization. Then it was a wide scale problem. So trying to, to look at how do we create an organization and, and this is after I left Catholic Relief Services and went back to, to graduate school, mm -hmm. but looking at how do we make this better? How do we make sure that projects are more sustainable? Because about half of them were failing. And that's when, you know, I look towards, you know, creating a new nonprofit and that, you know, just basically was back in 1991 and invited together a bunch of family and friends to come have a dinner. And then we raised about $4,300 for a water project in Central America, in, in Honduras, in fact. It, it was really more a visceral response than it was like, I'm going to launch a big nonprofit organization. It was like, let's raise money for this one community in, in, uh, in Honduras uh, and kind of go from there. Well, somewhere along the line, you seem to have some kind of eureka moment that would you know alter the course of your thinking on some visit to, is it pronounced... Hyderabad? Hyderabad. Hyderabad. Hyderabad, India. Thank you. C can you share that story? And, and when exactly was that? Yeah. So when I embarked on this and then, you know, that we did that first dinner, that then did lead into starting up a nonprofit organization. And eventually the name evolved to become Water Partners. So it was very much a traditional kind of water NGO approach of like, okay, let's raise philanthropic money and let's go out and get projects built with communities around the world. And we would partner with local organizations to get that done. But it's also the fact that, you know, when you look at a crisis as big as this, you know, literally, you know, more than a billion people without water and or sanitation, and you recognize like, okay, what's our solution? It's like, well, we raise charity and then we go do these projects. You pretty much, you know, if you, if you take a step back and say, okay, 
if the vision is to solve this full stop, and this is how we're solving it, how do you connect what we're doing with that vision? And frankly, you couldn't. Mm-hmm. And so that that was for me, like, that's disturbing. At about the same time, traveling around the world, talking with, you know, all kinds of people in different countries about how they were getting water each day, how they were meeting their sanitation needs each day. That's where, you know, these insights came in, right? So the insight that I got was, you know, I would talk to women who were going to loan sharks and paying, and this is in Hyderabad, right? That you talk about. I met this one woman who has, was paying 125% interest to a loan shark so that she could build a toilet at her home, you know, meeting other people. I did, you know, earlier on, I'd done my, my research for my thesis in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, and they're recognizing people were sometimes paying 25% of their income to get their water supply each day. And so this kind of awareness that what we were doing didn't match the scale of the problem. And then understanding that maybe with all this money that people are already paying to loan sharks, to water vendors, that they were paying in terms of their, their time as well, you know, scavenging for water, walking hours each day to find water, or they were sick because of the water that they were, they were drinking. So the insight was that this problem could contain its own solution. And if we could like help people get access to small loans so that they could then spend far less time and money on securing water every day, they would save that money or they would start working at a paying job and they could repay those loans. So that was kind of the the aha moment, you know, meeting a woman because people valued water and sanitation so much, they would pay for these things. They had to, right? Because they couldn't survive without it. But if we could find them a more affordable way, if they could get just a water connection to the public utility, they could reduce what they were paying for water, but they didn't have like the $300 it might cost to pay the connection fee and to do the plumbing. So they were trapped paying too much for water. So that was really kind of the, the insight there that led to water credit and uh, the, the different way we approach this problem beyond engineering and also looking at finance. Yeah. So just, I want to get to the whole new business model that you pretty much, you know, pioneered here with this lending model and, and more about what was behind that. But just to sort of, you know, illustrate the, the magnitude of this problem here so people understand it. I mean, first of all, it's a massive problem just in terms of the scale, its enormity. There's no region around the world that's not with its communities that are uh, massively impacted by this. But it's a problem that is disproportionately affecting women and girls. Can you talk about that linkage? Yeah, it's the burden for carrying water is seen as kind of a household task, right? And those tasks uh, almost always fall towards women and, and girls. And Oftentimes, if someone in the family is going to get to go to school, it's the boys, right? Because the girls are the ones who are out collecting water and, and, and helping with some of those domestic purposes. So certainly, this disproportionately affects, affects women. It uh, hinders their ability to uh, grow healthier food for their families, their ability to work at a paying job to contribute to the, to the family income, and it keeps girls out of school. And I think, you know, if there's anything that we've come to realize over the past couple of decades, it's investing in, in women is really a smart investment for helping to lift families out of poverty. So, uh, you know, over 80% of the, the, the loans that our partners provide for water and sanitation improvements are provided to, to women. And this then helps them kind of get out of this very inefficient times that they spend collecting water or the cash that they spend on it and helps liberate them to live better lives for their families, to improve their health, to improve their education, just to help them kind of, you know, get that first hand on the the rung of the economic ladder that can lift them out of poverty. Mm. And so you've got these, these people in these villages that, like you say, are paying upwards of like a quarter of their income uh, to get access to water. And then so that you've, you've got this insane, you know, financial burden on the one hand, but then you've also got these exorbitant medical costs because a lot of people in these impoverished villages, they're contaminating the, the very water that they drink because even if they may have access to drinking water, they may not have access to sanitation, to a toilet. So 
Now they're having to go relieve themselves outside, contaminating the very water that they need and, you know, because it's seeping into the water supply. So now you've got the financial burden, you've got, you know, the medical burden, you mentioned the education. It just seems to hit from from every which direction. It, it does. And I think that's, again, we experienced this, you know, 100 or 200 years ago, and we were experiencing the same thing. Uh, it's just that we figured out how to build this infrastructure and to put it put it into place. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what is still lacking. It's, it's, it's hard to believe that so many people still live with a situation with a, a problem that we solved 100 years ago. Some of the diseases, you know, that we think about that you can imagine, like cancer and how that touches us. Imagine if we found the cure for cancer today and a hundred years from now, a million people were still dying from cancer. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what is is happening here. And it's like, how do we help people kind of at least get to this basic level of health and economic well-being? That's just water, right? It it, it seems unfathomable that uh, we haven't been able to, to solve for this yet. Like you mentioned, you sort of came to this conclusion that charity in and of itself isn't going to solve the problem, uh, you know, just given the scale and, and the magnitude. So you came to the conclusion that microloans would be a much more sustainable solution than the grants. And of course, today we can look at all the success you've had in, in Waterhead, Oregon. It, it seems so obvious, but I imagine it had to be somewhat controversial at the time, right? Because you're essentially making impoverished people take out loans for something that seems like it should be such a basic, you know, human right is, is clean water. So maybe walk me through the thesis at the time in terms of why that would be a better solution than the prevailing one. Yeah, well, I think part of it is, is in the question, you know, the, the fact that we, we knew that there was never going to be enough philanthropy to get everybody water around the world. You know, I would, I would be in communities and talking to people and, and talking to people at the household level who are just like, can't you get us a grant so that we can improve this? And, you know, I would meet these NGOs around the world that, you know, they would keep like these thick binders of all the communities that had come to them asking for help to improve their water situation. And frankly, they just weren't getting that philanthropy. And, and to me, to see so many people wanting help but not being able to get it and then also recognizing how much value this created for their lives like well we then came up with this hypothesis of what if you know we worked with our ngo partners to offer these communities a loan uh, because we knew we didn't have enough money to to give it the money away and then it's like they stepped forward and they said yes of course you know we'll take a loan and we'll we'll pay it back and that was kind of one of my learning moments right at first we became the bank or we tried to become the bank for a lot of these communities particularly in africa and it didn't go so well right because the the folks who were used to getting help were used to getting grants and now it's like well we have to repay this loan and so we only got repaid about 50 percent on those mm-hmm. and so but still the problem was there it's like there is a demand and there is a willingness and ability to pay at least something for this. And then looking at those individuals I've met who were, who were going to the loan sharks and saying, you know, paying that exorbitant interest rate. Mm -hmm. So the the spark was there. It's just like, okay, how do we make this happen? We don't want to be the bank ourselves because people are not used to repaying NGOs. They're used to NGOs like us making grants. And so let's, figure out how to partner with people who are already banking the poor. And those were microfinance institutions. And so that was the the next move in this after we kind of failed, you know, doing loans directly. It's like, how do we then nudge microfinance towards water and sanitation? And, you know, I knocked on the doors of, I don't know how many, you know, MFIs, microfinance institutions, particularly in, in Asia, some in Africa said, hey, we really have studied this problem. We know how much people are paying for water. We know how it affects them. We know that this adds value. Why don't you guys make loans now for water connections and water filters and toilets? And they're like, no way. It's like, we, we loan for income generating purposes. Like we'll loan to a woman for a sewing machine 
because by the end of the week, she's sewing clothes and I see the cash flow that she can then use to repay the loan. Yeah, they, they loan it the same way you'd get a small business loan right exactly. here in this country, right? For some yeah. small entrepreneurial venture. So so when you're getting all these no's and, and they're like, no, 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 this is our traditional model. Walk through an example of, because obviously the, the loan has to be repaid somehow. So how would it work? Paint a picture of somebody that gets one of these loans that's just being used to you know, get a water tap, uh, get a toilet, what have you. How does that then get repaid? Yeah. And that, that was kind of what these MFIs were wondering. It's like, we don't see that working, so we're not going to make a loan for this. And so fast forward, you know, a few years, and I can tell you exactly how it works with, uh, you know, the, this one woman who I met in the Philippines, her name was Lena Riza. She was paying about $60 a month for water from this vendor who would come around and sell it off the back of a truck. So $2 a day, you know, $60 a month is what she was paying because she had no other way to get water. And put that in perspective, like what kind of household income would there be, roughly speaking? She was probably making about probably her family, you know, she was working, her husband was working. So they, they as a family were maybe making, you know, $10 a day, $15 a day at the most. So right? once again, you're talking like 20%. Yeah. Huge amount for water. But she couldn't afford, you know, the $300 or so it would take to pay the connection fee until she got a loan from one of our partners. So she got the loan. So her loan payments for about two years will be about $5 a month. And her water tariff now that she pays to the utility is about $5 a month. So she was paying 60. Now she's paying 10. Right. So obviously, you know, she is going to more than make up for the, the cost of the loan is going to be able to repay it. And so what we've seen now is that, you know, more than 43 million people around the world have gotten access to water through these small loans and they're repaid at a rate between 98 and 99 percent. So it, it tells you, you know, that, that this is creating value for people and that's why they're taking out the loans. And I can't tell you, you know, this is $3.5 billion in loans, right, that have been driven to this that are not charity. I can't tell you how long it would take to raise that type of philanthropy. Oh, forever and a day. Forever and a day. That's how it works. So these MFIs, now we have to go back in time now to when I'm knocking on the doors to, to get them engaged. And so they wouldn't do this on their own. So what we had to do was use this philanthropic capital that we raised to kind of de-risk water and toilet loans for them. And so we would give them grants to do market research to understand people's need for water and sanitation and what they would pay for the types of toilets, the types of water uh, filtration devices. We, you know, we gave them grants to hire the right kind of people who understood water and sanitation to design new loan portfolios that would target these things. Once we did that and kind of de-risk this for them, they started to see that it would work. And then they started scaling up their, their water and sanitation lending. And so that's that's kind of where we're, we're at today, uh, is working with more than 150 of these partners around the world who now are making water and toilet loans because we helped nudge them towards that. Now, somewhere along the way, Matt Damon enters the picture. Mm -hmm. Now, some people listening, or maybe a lot of people listening, or thinking like, wait, is that, no, yes, that Matt Damon. <laughs> uh, so what was the genesis of this relationship? Hmm. So, yeah, so he had started with some uh, other colleagues, an organization called H2O Africa that was focused on water. Got introduced to him because of that. And then we met for the first time uh, in 2008 at the Clinton Global Initiative uh, in New York and kind of discussed our, our different approaches. And certainly we, you know, we definitely saw this intersection, this spark at the time, you know, Matt's organization hadn't been around that long, uh, but obviously it had, you know, great ability to drive awareness and, and revenue. And, you know, we had been at this, you know, for almost a couple of decades at that point. And so, it's like, okay, what if we we joined forces and, you know, put the two organizations together, which, you know, he and I clicked. And so it made a lot of sense to, to do that. And then the following year at the next Clinton Global Initiative, we announced the merger of the two organizations uh, of uh, H2O Africa, at that time, Water Partners, to then form water.org. 
and one of the things that made me comfortable to do that with Matt was I saw his commitment. You know, I knew he wasn't going to just be a celebrity spokesperson. Well, and that's the key here because I mean, let's be honest, right? Most celebrities are nothing more than just that. And by the way, I I don't want to you know throw them under the bus right no, we need all the no. spokespeople we, we need all the money we can get for all sorts of causes but you know they're pushing one cause today another one tomorrow there's no staying power it's a flavor of the month um and so there clearly was some sort of commitment from from matt but at the same time i mean you know you're, you're devoting your life to this this is 24 7 for you you know matt's still an actor so you felt that there was enough there that this could be a good long-term business partner for you as well? Yeah, I, I, I did because one thing you recognize when you meet Matt for the first time, he's a super smart guy too. I mean- it, Well, I saw Good Will Hunting, so I, I know he yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, he was a few credit hours from graduating <laughs> from Harvard, you know, when he got his break. So, uh, so, so I saw his passion for this. I saw how intelligent he was. And sometimes you just know, and it, it definitely is borne out. I mean, he's, you know, traveled to multiple countries with us to, to learn about the problem firsthand. You know, we spend a lot of time with people, you know, at the World Bank and other kind of institutions to try to drive more financing to this. You know, at Davos, we're always there kind of pitching the power of these solutions. Uh, and, and so, he has literally become one of the world's water experts over the last, you know, more than a decade now, as he's kind of wrapped his head around this. And he has a, a you know, he talks about, you know, he has three things in his life. He has his family, he has his day job, <laughs> and then he has water.org and, and water equity. And that's where he, he really invests his time. And it definitely is, has paid off both in terms of his time, but also his philanthropic support. I mean, he's the, the largest individual financial contributor to this mission as well. And so beyond the financial contribution, which is, I know is a big piece of it, what's the main role that he provides? Is it being an evangelist and, and speaking around the world and raising awareness, uh, trying to drum up additional dollars, or is there some other kind of role that he plays? Yeah, it, it's really all of the above. I mean, literally with finance ministers that we've we've talked to uh, to try to help direct more financing towards this cause to, you know, Matt's an incredible storyteller, obviously, given uh, the, the nature of his work. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I can I can kind of do the nerdy engineer stuff. He can do that, but he can also bring a human element to the story. So as a storyteller, it's it's very powerful. I think that, you know, hopefully that's come through in, in the book and making this crisis, you know, putting more of a human face on it. I think, you know, you've probably seen the, the work that we've done in partnership with Stella Artois, where we have worked with them to not just you know, do standard commercials, but to have Matt tell the story of water and why it makes a difference in the lives of people around the world and get those those commercials on the Super Bowl, for instance, uh, so people can understand. So it, it's at all those different uh, levels, he's definitely plugged in. Well, I'm sure he's learned a ton from you just in terms of your you know domain expertise, you know, especially early on. Anything that you have learned from Matt uh, whether it's sort of directly or just through osmosis that mm. you sort of, you know, absorbed and and adopted and has helped you be a better leader? I, yes, for sure. I think, you know, just the way he approaches problem solving as well, uh, you know, certainly is the storytelling. And, and I'd like to believe, you know, over the decade or so I've known Matt, I've become a little bit better of a storyteller. But I think, his ability to to look at the problem in different ways as well. In fact, this is this is the the genesis of water equity, right? So, we were in India together talking to all of our different uh, partners that we were working with, our finance partners, and asking them what's their bottleneck, what's keeping them from doing even more mm -hmm. in terms of loans at the household level, and they said we need more consistent access to affordable capital, big chunks, millions of dollars to, to be able to do this. And that's where, you know, he was hearing this and I was hearing this and it's just like brainstorming. And he's like, you know, we could put this fund together. You know, we could, we could launch a, a fund for impact investors if we can get a financial return for them. And he, that's where he agreed, like, I'll put in the first million dollars for that fund. Let's go raise it. And, you know, we raised about $11 million dollars. Uh, through impact investors in the U.S., and that was really the birth of water equity, which is now, 
you know, the world's first asset manager that's focused just on water and sanitation for low income populations. And now water equity, you know, has more than $200 million of committed capital that is providing a financial return to investors while also helping millions of people get water and sanitation. That spark came, you know, through Matt and doing that, you know, back in 2015 or whatever year that was that, that we kind of had that experience together. So I think that that speaks to, you know, how deep he is in this, how, you know, he looks at it analytically as well as emotionally and can can help us grow the impact that, that we have. So this is back during the early days of impact investing, which is now becoming an increasingly, you know, pretty sizable asset class. Back then it wasn't. Um, so this whole notion of double bottom line investing was, you know, foreign to a lot of people. So it was another pivot you had as a business. And again, makes sense today because it's clearly worked. But you guys got a lot of rejections when you're out, right, trying to raise money for the, the impact investment fund, if you will, that sister organization that you had, right? Because people in their heads either you're investing to make money or you're giving it away. And you, this yeah. is sort of like an in-between. So that it wasn't so easy to uh, overcome that resistance, right? No. And it, you know, going back to like, for some of the same reasons, those MFIs didn't jump on this initially. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like, how are you ever going to make this a, a viable financial go for people making a few dollars a day? So there was this disconnect that how can you actually you know, get a financial return on something that is about making water loans to people making a few dollars a day and suspending disbelief. That's what we had to be able to do with this. And so certainly the first investors, you know, we we were projecting at that time that maybe we'd get a one or 2% financial return for them. And so obviously we were kind of going after friends and family, going after people who would otherwise be making a million dollar donation to us maybe they make a million dollar loan to us, right? But even that, it was kind of hard for people to think about that intersection of making money versus charity. And so, but we were successful, you know, we did get enough uh, of our current, a lot of our philanthropic partners would still give to us, but then they also invested. And I think that, that was like finally making it, you know, when I talk about creating the financial plumbing Mm -hmm. that is needed in order to connect those capital markets, those impact investors to people making a few dollars a day. By doing that initial fund and proving that we could actually make this work, that people you know, living in poverty still got an affordable loan and had tremendous value created, and that some of that value could be passed up the chain to investors, then we knew we had something. And it was just a matter of like, how do we drive this model to be more efficient, take it to scale so that we can move the financial returns to a level that would make, you know, one of these investments a good part of anybody's portfolio, because we have been able to to move those rates up to uh, what we feel are pretty attractive rates for any investor. Mm -hmm. I think I read that. Uh, every dollar invested generates thirteen dollars worth of impact. Maybe you could help explain what what does that represent exactly? Well, that really represents like put yourself in the the place of that of Luna Riza, who I was just talking about, right? For her, that dollar invested generated far more than that in terms of actually cash saved. Other people, you you know, you can measure it in terms of you know the amount, the time that they were spending collecting water are waiting in queues for water, sometimes hours each day. And so the value that they recapture with that time every day and converting that into a paying job, you know, that $1 that they invest in, you know, uh, the ratio of one to 13, you can see that showing up if they get a small loan and now they have the ability to work 20% more of their time. So it's, it's basically, again, it all goes back to like, we couldn't fathom not having water for our day-to-day life. Imagine if you went from having no water right now for your life to having even 10 gallons a day, right? Do you think the ratio would be one to 13? It would probably be even more explosive than that to you, right? So it only makes sense that that this is what happens. There's one other really illustrative story. 
it's about this woman in in Uganda. Uh, she goes by the name of Mama Florence. She's a grandmother, and she was spending you know hours on her bicycle, moving around her community trying to find enough water for her family every day. And so she took out a loan. You know, she has uh, a water pump and a water tank now at her house, and she uh, uses the water to grow a garden. Uh, for vegetables. She uh, uses water to raise pigs for her family and to sell. And she also obviously uses water to improve their health. But then she started using the water to make bricks from the clay soil that was near her house. And she used those bricks to make an addition onto her house as well as selling bricks. And she also now rents out a room, you know, that's on her house because of these bricks. So you can just see how water unleashes incredible, you know, entrepreneurship for one thing, but also incredible financial improvements for, for households. And that's, it's just something that we, we take for granted, but that's how it all started for all of our economies. Well, I think today you've reached over 43 million people. I know still a long way to go, but it, it feels to me like uh, incredible progress. You know, but I was thinking about all the decades you've been in this. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure it hasn't all been up and to the right, you know, if you will, <laughs> right? I, I, so I was just thinking, like, how many days, weeks, months, may, maybe even for you, period of years, where you must have been banging your head against the wall, making little to no progress. Any moment at all over all these years, all these decades, where you just said, you know, I, I've given it my all. Enough is enough. Time to move on and, and just you know, we're about to throw in the towel ever that, that moment. No, <laughs> that is a short answer. You know, I can't explain all the reasons why, but, but I guess for me, the, the challenge is always, you know, removing the next barrier. And so there's a series of barriers in any kind of, I mean, a problem this big, that's been around for this long, there must be a lot of barriers or else we would have figured it out a long time ago. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of the, charge or the satisfaction or the the confidence that you get by clearing one of those barriers and then moving on to the next. And so there's always the series of wins along the way. But yes, there's always another barrier after that. And I think, you know, even looking at this from the, the start of like, okay, we, we're not going to just do this by drilling wells. How do we remove that barrier to finance? And then finding that insight that, okay, the problem has its own solution. We just have to nudge things. And then you get over that barrier and say, okay, we can make something like small loans work. And then you realize that, you know, there's another barrier beyond that in terms of like, okay, we need more capital in the system. And so then you go out and you innovate and you create water equity as an, as an asset manager, right? And now we see the barrier that, you know, it's not just going to be about bottom-up capital with these microloans, but we've got to drive infrastructure financing to serve low-income neighborhoods in these countries around the world. So now we're looking at an infrastructure financing part of, of water equity. Yes, if I looked at it as just like, you know, when I started this over 30 years ago, would there still be, you know, almost a billion people without water? I, that would have been very depressing to me, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, to see that it wouldn't be solved by now. And yet I see that we are making progress because we can just like, you know, it, we just need more innovation. We need more thinking. I mean, imagine if we put as much kind of intellectual horsepower into solving this crisis from an entrepreneurial perspective as we put into the, you know, the 13th, 14th generation of the iPhone, right? <laughs> I mean, it, it would be incredible. It would be we, solved it. many, many years ago, for sure. Yes. And so I think that's why I don't give up hope. I just, th there's always a solution. It's just a matter of using, you know, your insight and your tenacity and, you know, inspiration to find that next solution. And it's not, it's not all going to be one solution at one time. And it's not going to be a silver bullet, but it's going to be an evolution of solutions that, that get us there. And, and, and by the way, I think that the reason I have hope now is because for the first time, we see how we can use philanthropy to transcend philanthropy to get to the capital markets. If we can use the global capital markets to solve this problem, that's, you know, theoretically like an infinite pool of capital versus philanthropy, which is inherently limited. And so the more we can use that capital 
to come into the system and make it fair for people living in poverty and help them in, in really substantial ways, then this problem does become much more tractable. So as I'm listening, I'm, I'm trying to you know, piece together some of the ingredients of all of the success that you've had. And again, recognizing it's, it's not over, uh, but you've come a long way. And so there's certainly this theme of you know, tenacity, of, of stick to itiveness, mm-hmm. because uh, even though, yes, there's always another hurdle, that's, that's a long, long time to maintain mm-hmm. your, your motivation, right? I don't know how many, if you're counting all the no's you've gotten from whichever uh, incarnation mm-hmm. of business model you've had over the years, I'm sure it would add up. And that's the other piece, which is the fact that you've reinvented this business over and over, all the pivots you've had, inventing a new business model that today we take for granted but didn't exist, you know, back in the day, right? Reconstituting microloans for this kind of thing. So there's this element of, you know, innovation, right? Creativity, seeing around corners. There's clearly a strategic element, the resilience you've got. Anything else you think that if you sort of were to take a step outside and, and look at the success, and I, I, I know you're a modest person, but what else do you think it is that's enabled this organization to be so successful? Yeah, I think as I look back on like what brought me here, uh, which I think is a, a part of the success that uh, it gets down to maybe curiosity, you know, that maybe seems like a weird place to start, but I think that's something that I kind of always had, you know, even as a kid growing up, curiosity about, you know, taking things apart, putting them back together, you know, uh, leading me to engineering. But it, it's curiosity is the start. And then I think insight, I think trying to learn as much as I could from people who don't have water, trying to learn as much as I could about how they got water, how that impacted their lives, their health, their finances and trying to gain those insights and then harvesting those in terms of an innovation. And, you know, that is really the story of, of water credit and doing the loans. So it's a, it's a curiosity that leads to these insights that leads to, then you got to execute, right? I mean, that's, that's the other thing about this. And I think the engineering background I had probably, you know, helped, you know, a little bit uh, analytically and how you get things done. And so I think all that, then if you look at it, like, what do you layer on top of that Mm -hmm. is like, you know, that kind of thirst for social justice that was layered into that. Now, now you go into the, to the social entrepreneurial realm, as opposed to entrepreneurial, all those other things could be applied anywhere. You go into the social entrepreneurial realm and you look at like, do you have that same commitment to social justice, that same spirit that you have in your entrepreneurial spirit? what what kind of problem are you trying to solve is it is it so big and audacious that you want to want to tackle it like the this crisis and then i think you put all those things together with that tenacity and then uh, it works and then you got to convince others right you have, you have to be a storyteller one of the most frustrating things and the times where it has been not wanting to quit but certainly the greatest frustration is philanthropy itself and how fickle it is right you can do all of these things you can like create elegant solutions powerful solutions that help people living in poverty but if you're relying on philanthropy it's incredibly fickle you know you can and we do this right we've experienced it we've had partners and foundations and corporations that give us grants and we go out and exceed all of the metrics that they ask of us and then they drop off because they found another cause or it's just like, okay, well, we're changing direction. It's like, where does that happen in the business world? You know, if you're thriving and developing a product and meeting expectations of customers, you always get your stock price goes up. That's just the way it works in this world. It doesn't. And certainly that's one of the greatest frustrations when we've hit a wall where, you know, when COVID hit and our donors just kind of dropped way down or just because of other reasons. So I think that's, and then the really frustrating thing is that this is against a backdrop of minting more billionaires every year than we ever minted before, where we have people supposedly giving their money away in greater levels. And with the exception of Mackenzie Scott and Jack Dorsey, who are like my heroes right now, who are investing in organizations like ours to, to do better. That's what needs to be happening, but it's not. 
even people in the giving pledge that you know Bill Gates and Warren Buffett launched, there are a lot of pledgers, but there's not a lot of givers. A lot of the money just gets recycled back into family foundations where it sits or into these donor advice funds. And so there is definitely a frustration that there are so many social entrepreneurs like us that are out there that are starved for that investment. And the money is just sitting there parked uh, in the bank, despite the wealth that's been created. That's the times when I've been the most frustrated with uh, the whole process, not kind of the innovations on the breakthrough that we do in the communities that we serve. Agree with you 100% on that. We mentioned the threat of religion when you were growing up. Mm -hmm. Is that still with you? Are are you a man of faith? I am. Yeah, I am. Uh, I think probably definitely a religious element there, but it's probably skewed a little bit more towards spiritual. I think that the two aren't mutually exclusive for sure, but sometimes I see kind of religion can get in the way of spirituality sometimes. Well, I guess where I'm going is, you know, do you feel that you, know, you were put on this earth to fulfill this mission in some way? I do. I do feel, I do feel that. I'm still, <laughs> I'm still figuring out why I was put on this earth, uh, but I'll, maybe one day I'll I'll figure it out. Well, no, I, I've had you know I, I'd say I, I've had the luxury of knowing what I wanted to do from a fairly early age. You know, since I since I was an undergraduate in university, I knew what I was going to be doing. You know, one of my greatest fears early on was that I I would lose that that, okay, that maybe this was a phase for me, you know, maybe my life would unfold in such a way that I didn't have the ability to do a startup and take no salary for a number of years. And so that was definitely a fear, but it turned out to be unfounded, uh, which I'm grateful for. And to, to have been able to stay focused on this for so many years, maybe that's another one of those ingredients, right? Sometimes you just need longevity and kind of the the, you know, having ability to observe the problem over many years to evolve the solutions. Mm -hmm. So that's probably, you know, a big part of this as well, just kind of the the longevity of of focusing on a single problem. And I feel very fortunate. Thomas Edison, I think, said, uh, I never did a day's work in my life. It was all fun. (laughs) Uh, I would say that uh, not every day has been fun for me, but, you know, 99.9% of the days I'm not watching the clock. And I, that's that's a, something that I'm incredibly grateful for over over the decades. Well, I think the goal, your goal, and, and this organization's goal, water.org, uh, is to solve the water crisis in your lifetime. And if I got my numbers right, that means providing about three quarters of a billion people access to safe water, and about 1.7 billion access to a toilet to to clean sanitation effectively. Uh, you know, definitely audacious, but you know, why not aim high? Mm-hmm. Do you, in your heart of hearts, think in your lifetime that's really achievable? I do, I do, and you know, we're not trying to create a miracle cure here, right? Uh, if if nobody in the world had water or sanitation now, and we didn't know how to make it happen. That might be like too audacious. Like if, if safe water means hadn't been invented, but the fact that you know, we have to look at the billions of people who do have that and say, why not, right? And so I am optimistic because we know how to do it. I'm more optimistic because we do see the, you know, more momentum coming behind this with climate change and the need to to sustain our water resources better. We see more corporations stepping up and saying, okay, we need to ensure equitable access for water in the communities where we operate. We're seeing a lot more of that. And again, if we hadn't been able to map the capital markets to this problem, I would be you know, much less convinced. But again, if we can continue to scale the solutions to the hundreds of millions of people who really only lack access to finance to be able to solve their own water crisis, uh, that is going to be a huge thing. Now, again, I don't want to be you know, completely Pollyannish about this. There are still people in such extreme poverty that even something like finance doesn't work for them. Mm-hmm. But if we can segment the market and, and reach you know, the lion's share of people through the capital markets and connecting them like through this financial plumbing, 
that gives me great hope that some of that the funds that are there for subsidies can help you know the marginal people that that are too poor which is what percent of the total pie roughly speaking we believe that the probably 60 70 percent of the people who lack access to water now would be able to benefit from access to capital as opposed to needing a hundred percent subsidy approach to them and that that's a lot and that makes the problem a lot more a lot more manageable so gary the last hour has been on this podcast called the art of excellence i don't know if you know how i end my show but i always ask guests when they think of the word excellence what the word means to them what do you think i think it it varies by person but i think it's like doing the very best that you're capable of doing and I think it means that you're always striving to do better with what you have. And, uh, and I feel like that, you know, I've been blessed with a lot. Uh, some of the things we've talked about, just the, the commitment, the tenacity and having had an education. And it is tapping into that whole concept, you know, to whom much is given, much is expected in return. And to me, Excellence is always about closing that gap, right? And being complacent is about leaving that gap open. And that to me is, is excellence. If you can bring back to the world, you know, as much or more than what, that, what you got out of it, then I think that's, that's probably my definition of personal excellence and being able to always put more in than I take out. I like it. I like that answer. I, I, mean this from the bottom of my heart, which is, uh, you know, honestly, Gary, thank God we have people like you that are so mission driven in their lives to not just want to start something to do good, but I mean, to never give up. I, I hope you're able to pull up, if you will, and, and take a look at what you've done, mm. which is incredible. But I also get that, uh, you know, the mission is one where it won't be solved tomorrow or next month, but you you stick at it, uh, and I'm hopeful for you as well. And uh, mm -hmm. kudos to you for what you've done here and the amazing work that uh, this organization has done. And uh, I wish you all the best as you continue on this fight. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. Thanks for for being uh, you know a channel for us to reach more people. And again, if people want to learn even more about the journey, you know, the, the book, The Worth of Water, we just published recently, and Matt and I uh, wrote that, and we are donating all of our author proceeds back to water.org, of course. And so if people want to dive into this more, take it to their book club, you know, give it as a gift, that can mean that they also are enlisted in this cause and, and helping bring solutions. So thank you for helping us reach uh, people with the message, Glenn, really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for listening. Okay, don't go. Don't go yet, please. Two favors, I ask. Simply two favors. One, if you could please download the iTunes app. You could do it on your phone. You can do it on the computer. Um, take 60 seconds and leave a review. It means a lot. Two, you can find my episodes on several social media sites, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Find the one that you like the most. Find the one where you tend to have a lot of friends and followers. And if you could please either share it in the case of uh, Facebook and LinkedIn or retweet it uh, on Twitter, uh, that would mean the world to me. So those are the two asks I have. I love putting together this podcast. I hope you enjoy listening to it. Thank you so much. And I will see you again next time. Bye-bye.